Daniel Crosslink, welcome back to the Crosslink channel where we talk about 3D printing, 3D scanning and 3D design. So this is the Mingna D2 and Mingna sent it to me a few weeks ago so I had a lot of time testing it so about 100 hours of test printing went into this and I want to introduce you to some of the test results in a bit but let's start with a few key points about this printer. So the print volume of this printer is supposed to be 230 by 230 by 260 millimeters. However, the 260 millimeters of print height, probably not in every situation you can use them. We'll talk about that in a bit. So it has a direct drive extrusion system, which makes it different from other Ender clones. So to say, it looks like an Ender clone, but it's also different. You can also see that it has a different base part here, that this whole basement is an enclosure that's from metal that makes it also a little bit different from other clones and it has a filament sensor as well so this is becoming a standard i would say i've seen this on a lot of printers now except the creality ender models they still don't have that it has a removable magnetic build plate which is also nice because you can take off your prints much easier i was never a big fan of the glass plate you've probably seen me talking about that so i appreciate that this is a flexible magnetic thing to remove then we have dual z-axis motors which is something that is not common in the Ender world and Ender clones. And if you think about it, um, just the upgrade for a dual set axis motor is $40 to get the second motor and the second lead screw. So that is quite an upgrade, I would say. And then we have a color touch screen here at the front, which is also easy to use. It looks a bit like the TFT35 from Big Tree Tech and it works very similar. We also have a full size SD card slot in the front. One thing that it doesn't have is a build touch or any other probe. So that that is unfortunate, but probably at the price point of this printer, it's not to be expected. Still, you probably can upgrade that. We'll see that in the electronics part of this video. Talking about the price point, this printer will cost you around 200, maybe a little bit less. Currently, it's 180, so it's a bit discounted. I'll put a link in the description of this video where you can get it for a discount at the moment. We'll see in the later part of this video if that is actually worth the price, if the features that it has are actually worth the money. <music> So let's start with the build process because that was what I had to do first. This printer comes in two parts, so you have to assemble those, you have to plug in some cables. So the whole process will take you 30 minutes and it's not too complicated. So I guess for beginners that's going to be doable. I had no issues using the manual for building the printer, so there wasn't any questions open. I think the quality of the manual is very good and probably again I, I would say for beginners this is absolutely doable. The build quality in general is very good. I would say the quality of the materials is good for the price. There wasn't anything that was loose except one screw of I think it was the y-axis motor that I had to reattach. Everything else was um, yeah was very well mounted. Also the alignment of the wheels so the pressure on the extrusions was already preset. I just did some minor adjustments and then I was ready to go for the first test print. One thing I don't want to forget to mention is that the frame was a little bit of wobbling on my table when I built it. So this was one of the supporting uh, rubber feet that was a little bit too short. So I had to fix that by introducing some kind of spacer and then now it's perfectly standing on the table without any wobbling. So let's get through the individual parts of the printer. Let's start with the extrusion system because that is what makes this printer different and unique unique. So as I told you already, it is a direct drive extrusion system and it has a standard nozzle on it. So there's nothing special about the nozzle here. Uh, it takes 1.75 millimeter filament. So everyone is using that. And what I found is that it's actually quite easy to insert the filament into this system. So for other direct drives, it is a little bit more difficult. For example, on the ANIT A8, which has a very simple direct drive system. Here it's actually much easier because it has a distinct filament path where it can only go down one path so it can't escape uh, anywhere to the side and you can optionally use a PTFE tube here at the top and insert that and guide the filament even a little bit better. 
However, we we'll see that this can also be an issue later uh, printing higher things. So we'll talk about that in a bit. What I also found is that it has two cooling fans and one cooling fan, of course, is cooling the filament here down on the print bed when it's printing. And that fan is a very small fan. So it's, a, it's very much the same fan as on the Ender models. So the fan duct here on this thing is, is quite large. So it has a large opening and there is not much airflow coming out of it. So I think cooling wise, you would have to improve this by adding a bigger parts cooling fan in the future just to get the best results. It is working, but I think it can be improved. There is a second fan that is supposed to cool the heat break here that's sitting above the nozzle and that heat break needs some airflow going through it so it can effectively cool down the heat break, the heat pipe that is now where the filament goes in from the top. So the heat doesn't creep up and doesn't melt the filament too much uh, in the upper areas of the system. So that fan has only a tiny gap between the inlet and the second fan, the actually the parts cooling fan. So they are very close together and I have some doubts that this is very effective. However, after one half hours of printing, I can say I only had one little issue with the extrusion system having some clock and then this was easily removed. I can't tell you if that was due to the lack of a more powerful uh, heat break cooling fan, but this is something that I personally would probably improve if I would modify this printer in the future. <music> Now let's talk about the build plate and the build surface. So the build surface is a removable BuildTech like plastic sheet with a magnetic backside on, on probably a magnetic counterpart here on the uh, aluminum plate that is heated. That is easy to use. So you just have to put it down and then you can get started. And if you need to remove your print, you just take it off and pop off the print and then put it back. I really like that a lot more than a glass plate system because it has more flexibility in different use cases and it's faster to get things off. So probably less issues and it's very sticky. So parts really stick well to this, even at lower temperatures. Some materials like, for example, a flexible filament can be printed at room temperature on this and you can probably keep your temperatures for PLA low, uh, probably 40 degrees Celsius. That's what I used. My results were pretty good. So I would say you don't have to go a lot higher than that for PLA and TPU and maybe other filaments will work at 50 to 60 degrees and you don't have to go higher if you have the right nozzle distance. Let's quickly talk about the display. I mentioned it already. It's a color touchscreen display. So I'm gonna give you some close-ups here. It is easily usable. So it's very reactive. The menu system is fine. And we'll talk about the firmware. So the details of that menu in a bit, but I can tell from the screen, it's probably something very similar to the Big Tree Tech TFD35. And it's also working together with the main board. So it works hand in hand and seems to be working fine. The main board of this printer is a custom Mingdao main board, so it's nothing standard. It works together with the screen. They are both connected with a ribbon cable and they work together. It's a 32-bit main board, which is really good because that means it's future-proof and it's fast. And it also is supposed to run Marlin firmware because Mingda offers Marlin source code files for this printer for downloading. So you can customize that if you are a little bit more advanced in, into customizing your printer firmware. This is possible. This is also nice to see. This main board has TMC2208 drivers, which are really silent. And that's also the most silent thing on this printer. We'll talk about that in a second. And it has additional upgrade ports, for example, for NeoPixel RGB LEDs, or also a build charge sensor or another probe that you might want to install later on this printer to improve your results even more. Talking about the firmware, because we know it's Marlin firmware, it's a custom version of Marlin firmware. One thing that I really want to talk about is how spartanic the menu is in terms of what it supports. It doesn't even support um, corner bed leveling, for, for example, which makes uh, adjusting the corners easier. It doesn't have any kind of auto bed leveling or mesh bed leveling. If you would add a probe, you can get a build touch specific firmware from Mingdat for downloading. But um, if you don't have the probe, you would probably appreciate something like uni unified bed leveling or mesh bed leveling, which isn't supported here in the menu. Also mentioning that it has a filament sensor. It doesn't have any kind of filament sensor menu 
except turning the sensor off and on. But if you have a sensor and you know a little bit about Marlin firmware, you will know that there is a filament change menu in Marlin, which you can use to easily change your filament, getting it out and getting it in most of the time fully automated and this is not in the menu so this is a little bit of um, a downer i think the firmware itself is probably the weakest part of this printer because um, specifically the menu is so sparse that it only has a bare minimum of functionality during printing you have a baby stepping menu at least but that's it and there is no set offset calibration available unless probably you have the build touch sensor but normally if you have this kind of printer and this is well adjusted, you don't need the probe and then mesh bedling is something that you will appreciate a lot. Let's have a look at the print quality because that is what probably most of you are interested in. And let's start with my first pair of benches and look at them in the close up. And these benches are fine. So the quality of the print is good. There's no ringing or heavy layer shifts or anything. So this looks fine from a layer perspective. However, there is some heavy stringing going on here. And I was wondering where this is coming from. So I decided that I won't go into tuning the printer for a bit. Instead, I started another test print to see um, if the stringing is really affecting larger prints. So this is the Wonder Woman sculpt from Eastman. I think Eastman is one of my favorite creators when it comes to sculpts. He does all kinds of super hero scars so i'm linking his patron account in the description of this video if you're interested in supporting this creator and this print came out really nice in terms of the layers from that perspective it looks really beautiful except the stringing is yeah is going on the same amount as in the benches and it's really a lot of stringing going on here and i wanted to look into that a little bit further how to improve it so i did a few iterations of optimizing the slicer profile that Cura delivers for this printer. So if you go to Cura, you will find a Minga D2 profile in Cura and that profile needs a bit of tuning because it's not optimized to reduce the stringing. If you see stringing on a printer in general, it doesn't need to be the printer. It's really mostly the slicer profile that needs some optimizations. Actually, before doing any kind of optimization, I also printed this uh, Torture Toaster by Clockspring, one of my other favorite creators. I'm also linking his patron in the description and he does all kinds of amazing mechanical things and it has some moving parts you can open it and that is all printed in place and it's supposed to test how good a printer is in terms of the preciseness and distances between layers and distances between individual parts that so that's coming out nice except the stringing was still going on here then I printed finally some flexible material um, that's also why probably some of you will want this printer because it has a direct drive and that's better with flexible filament and that octopus came out yeah good enough I would say so I would say from a quality perspective this printer gives you really nice results however the profile needs to be tuned a bit and I will link down in the description uh, to my website where I will upload this profile that I'm currently using which has some settings changed for it. Uh, probably most of the prints. From a speed perspective I've used 50 to 60 millimeters for the PLA prints and I've used 20 millimeters per second for the TPU print so I'm not going higher than that usually and on a direct drive which is heavier than the Bowden system I would never go higher than 50 to 60 unless you really need to do that and you are ready to compromise on the print quality. I've also looked at the noise levels and just wanted to get a subjective view on how loud the printer is and I would say yeah, knowing that it has TMC2208, the actual movement of the motor is actually really silent. So moving the print bed and the print head is super silent, but the loudest part on kind of every printer that I've tested so far is always another fan, which is the power supply fan. And this is true for this printer as well. This is the loudest fan on the printer. It's gonna like create more noise than anything else. And this is still a quite silent printer. It's more silent than the Ender 3 V2. That's uh, for sure. And the filament cooling fan and the heat block cooling fan are also quite silent. The power supply fan is the loudest and it's probably the hardest to make more silent because you either need to change the whole power supply or you need to modify it, which is probably not recommended. <music> Let's summarize quickly the issues that I had during my testing. And one of the issues was that the filament runout sensor at the position where it's mounted 
it will create some issues with higher prints. And I will show this to you. I have made a little clip here for you. If you are at about 200 millimeters of height with the Z axis and you have this PTFE tube attached and you're using PLA, the PLA already has to bend so much that it's really impossible to go higher with uh, this printer than 200 if you're using the filament sensor and the PTFE tube. If you're removing that PTFE tube, you can probably go a little bit higher, but you can still see that that is very limiting in terms of how the filament has to bend uh, when the head is moving back and forth. So I would suggest, and that is a little bit counterintuitive, but if you want to print at the full height of the printer, 260 millimeters, you will probably have to not use the filament sensor. And that's a little bit counterintuitive because higher prints will take more filament and you probably will have more issues because the filament is going to run out, especially on the higher parts. I was thinking about, can we change the position of the sensor? And it's difficult because the cable is integrated into the frame, which is a nice design because this cable goes inside of the frame and goes down to the electronics inside of the frame but that makes it really hard to change the position of the sensor so that is one thing that i would say needs to be changed you probably can use an additional cable and extend that cable and then get this problem fixed but at the position where this sensor is sitting it's not really usable for higher prints another thing where the profiles i mentioned it already the cura default profiles for the printer they need to be tuned to remove the stringing or reduce it to a bearable amount. So that is something that Mingda should improve in the future. The cooling fans, I think they need to improve the fan duct specifically for the parts cooling fan isn't very effective, I would say. And the other fan, the heat break cooling fan is too close to it. So I have some doubts about the effectiveness of that fan. And finally, one thing that is a little bit annoying just a tiny detail but this you can improve this by yourself um, quite easily but this spool holder it is fine it's full metal so quality wise i would say it's good but one thing this plate here in the front and also in the back they are both the same diameter and they are supposed to prevent the filament spool from falling down which is good and it's important but it's actually too large of a diameter some of my spools that i have aren't that large in terms of the inner diameter of the spool and they won't fit uh, perfectly over this so i would have to print another spool holder just because of this fact and it's also quite narrow so some of the larger ones like the amazon basics which are large larger or wider, uh, they won't fit on it also. So this is one part, again, I, I see this on so many printers that the spool holder is the part where the least amount of design work goes into. And this is, this is something that you can improve yourself quite easily, but it needs to be done. Who is this printer for? I think it's good for beginners if you are investing a few minutes into tuning it correctly. And if you use my Cura profile, which I'm linking in the description, you can get rid of most of the stringing and then you can get started quite easily with this printer. Don't forget to buy some filament because there's no sample filament coming with it. And a little more advanced viewers are probably not going to be happy with the menu, as I mentioned, because it's very sparse. So some functions like manual mesh bed leveling or unified mesh bed leveling, they need to be added. And then probably later you're going to add a bill touch sensor and a better cooling fan. So for someone who's a little more advanced, you will probably have to look into the firmware to improve that. But that's why, why we're tinkering around with these printers, aren't we? So the price value. For 180 dollars or euros, I would say it's a fair price because the 180 will give you something that you normally have to upgrade. For example, the second lead screw, the filament sensor, a touch screen, 32 bit, which is becoming the standard, the direct drive, which is mostly an upgrade on other printers. So I would say this printer has some potential for tinkering and for beginners, it will work and will work fine out of the box. That's it for today. And I hope you liked this video. If that is the fact, please hit like, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so you don't miss new videos. And if you're interested to watch more videos, I've linked two more videos here for you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.